tight agenda today. This is the Public Infrastructure, Environment, and Sustainability Committee for February 28th, otherwise known as PIES. And I'd like to call this meeting to order. And first off, we need approval of the minutes. Do I have a motion? So moved to approve the minutes. Second, anyone? Second. Great, thanks. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Post, aye. nay? Okay, good, thank you. Now, I didn't get anyone wanting the consent items taken off for discussion, so we're going to go ahead in order with the first one, which is I-90 Valley High Performance Transit Project Update, and I'd like to welcome Carl Otterstrom. Carl, is Susan going to be joining you, or are you doing solo today? She, she will not be joining us. Joining us, I have uh, with me Hamid Hajafari, Senior Transit Planner from STA, here today, but I will be making the presentation. Perfect. Thank you. Welcome, both of you. And go ahead. We've uh, allowed 10 minutes for this, so if you can keep it under that and give us time for questions, that would be great. Thank you. Happy to. So I can share my screen if that works. I think you do have a copy of this presentation, but I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to, to make sure we're uh, respecting your time, I'm going to go through this, uh, skip a few slides along the way. So uh, many of you are familiar. So good, good afternoon. I'm Carl Otterstrom, the Director of Planning and Development for Spokane Transit, and it's a pleasure uh, sharing an update with you on the I-90 Valley Corridor High Performance Transit Line. It's one of six corridors in the STA Moving Forward Plan uh, for additional investments. The vision of having frequent all-day two-way service uh, connecting parts of our community. The City Line, Division Line, Monroe Regal Line, Sprague Line, or other corridors within the City of Spokane, as well as the Cheney Line, which ends in the University District. The I-90 Valley Corridor, actually, uh, within the, the ST Moving Forward Plan, there's a number of different components to that, including a new transit center, expanded commuter parking east of Sullivan Road, direct nonstop peak hour service between Liberty Lake and Spokane, nine weekend service added, and then there is, as part of the plan, uh, and something that actually was very popular uh, with uh, when we went out for public outreach on this plan originally, both with our own employees as well as the general public, was extending service to Post Falls and Coeur d'Alene, but that's on a, uh, a pilot basis only and subject to an agreement for cost sharing with uh, uh, the cities in, in, in Kootenai County in North Idaho. Um, so this, this has some of the background. We do have federal and state grants secured in this project. We do have an overall corridor um, set of objectives for our corridor development planning effort uh, that are listed on the slide, uh, slide here. I'll just, again, be brief here. Um, we're doing this project because the region's growing. This is, that was a key corridor within our region's uh, plan uh, along, uh, especially those cities east of Spokane, but there's a lot of interest in coming to Spokane for people, for jobs, or they live in Spokane and they want to connect to jobs east of in the valley or even farther east. Um, there's a number of hot spots for growth in the greater Spokane Valley area, and Kootenai County is growing at an even faster rate of growth, one of the fastest metropolitan areas in the United States. And uh, those have impacts, real impacts on traffic congestion, Hotspots along I-90 are, are not just uh, infrequent occurrences, but daily. And um, the, the cross-state commutes are increasing. In fact, over the last 10 years, the amount of Spokane residents who work in Kootenai County have, has doubled. And Spokane County residents going into Kootenai County has doubled. Kootenai County residents going into Spokane County for uh, work has increased by 50%. So the fastest rate of growth is actually people heading to Coeur d'Alene. They have a faster job growth and housing growth, but even then there's actually more affordable housing in many cases in Spokane County at this point. Um, so this corridor development plan is really uh, a step within our efforts to implement ST moving forward to identify uh, in greater detail the specific improvements, their specific locations, and uh, the, the refined cost estimates. And so our effort includes uh, this funnel uh, is, is really the representation of the corridor development plan process, beginning with building blocks, uh, developing a, a set of, of early scenarios, 
and then funneling that down to a shorter set based on uh, evaluation criteria. And then further, uh, we're evaluating those uh, that scenario with uh, several different alternatives, permutations of that scenario uh, for uh, a number of different metrics looking at uh, uh, projected ridership, projected impacts on traffic, uh, environmental GHG emissions uh, differences in each scenario or each alternative, and uh, overall access to transit, uh, the transportation equity benefits are there. Uh, more low-income populations or other populations that have been overburdened by transportation in the past that benefit uh, from these projects. And then I bring that all into a more preferred scenario and then ultimately a draft uh, a corridor development plan. On this, this uh, I'll show you in the next slide, we have listed tax and uh, these three individuals and these little icons represent public outreach events. So the TAC is a technical advisory committee which began meeting Last uh, summer, we had two meetings at the TAC, and that includes staff of the different jurisdictions, including Washtenaw, Spokane County, City of Spokane, Millwood, Liberty Lake, and Spokane Valley, as well as STA. And then uh, the, the open house uh, we plan to have this week is open to the general public, and I'll share more about that later. So I mentioned funneling down 14 scenarios to a preferred scenario. This is, has included those building blocks, all the different things can, that can make kind of the recipe, uh, the ingredients, if you will, to create good transit, things like more frequency, um, bus stop improvements, uh, transit-only lanes, all those different pieces helped us define uh, a long list of scenarios, which then we shortlisted based on a, an initial screening process. And then it was really clear that uh, in our short our, our short list was still too long because there are too many permutations of that depending on where uh, ultimate, uh, ultimately uh, facilities are built. And so we did a land analysis looking at prospective sites based on eligible or available properties uh, currently on the market or on, uh, mostly undeveloped today and, uh, and or they are publicly owned and have developed uh, a single scenario that has three alternatives based on those different alt uh, alternative site uh, locations. Uh, these, this preferred scenario really looks at how do we connect along this I-90 corridor, not just in Spokane Valley, but to the city of Spokane and, and beyond in both directions. How do we balance speed and access? And one of the things we, we solved for this by actually proposing that this, the preferred scenario have three routes altogether rather than a single route to allow for many more destinations to be connected uh, for people to be able to use the bus directly without having to make a transfer or to be on a bus that gets off the freeway at every single interchange uh, and, and picks up people because that, that can actually uh, diminish ridership benefits uh, with that extra delay. And so uh, with that, I'm just going to build up. Here's this overall uh, corridor. You see Coeur d'Alene, Post Falls on the, the right-hand side to the valley, the Little Lake in the valley, the city of Spokane, and then out to the airport, which of course is in the city limits of Spokane, but then this actually shows West Plains. And Connect Spokane STA's comprehensive plan for public transportation envisions the I-90 corridor really spanning between the airport and Coeur d'Alene long term. Uh, but we do have a little twist on this, again, with these, these uh, different components. Uh, these orange uh, ovals represent um, areas that we're focusing on for major facilities, in particular uh, near Mirabu, the existing Mirabu uh, around Barker Road, and then in the Liberty Lake area we're looking at, are there candidate sites for new facilities uh, and uh, that will be funded as part of STA moving forward with the other locations as future uh, components of this corridor that we want to future-proof for but not necessarily build at this time. So then I'm going to layer on uh, the, the the corridors or the routes within this preferred architecture. The first one extends from the West Plains Transit Center to the airport downtown and then gets back on the freeway to uh, have a flyer stop at Argonne Road and then to get back on the freeway to our Pines, uh, our park and ride near Pines on Mir Mirabu, then actually stay off the freeway to Liberty Lake. So that allows people to make local connections, the Valley Mall, uh, a lot of the housing density that is extended along Indiana to Liberty Lake. 
This uh, also, by extending past the airport to the west, to the West Plains Transit Center, means that there is a direct connection between the West Plains Transit Center, the job activity along Geiger Boulevard, and the airport uh, to the valley. The next line envisions something kind of originating in the state line area, and then actually serving or traveling on Appleway Boulevard to the Green Acres area, and then uh, getting on the freeway uh, non-stop or potentially one stop at Argon Road, but traveling to uh, downtown. And, and instead of stopping at the plaza, actually extending that north to the uh, arena area, serving the county campus as well. And then a third line that would serve the, the really the center of the valley along Sprague Avenue, uh, beginning in the Green Acres area, and then west onto the freeway at the Sprague Interchange, and then actually getting off in the University District. Now, each of these lines, um, serve the greater downtown area in different ways, but none of them require more uh, layover capacity around the STA Plaza. Only one of the three would actually serve the plaza directly on the curb there. The North Bank uh, connection would serve on Monroe and Lincoln. The value of this uh, would be to recognize the capacity constraints we have at the plaza while providing connections to other locations. And in the university district, that would connect to the city line. People could continue downtown on the city line if they're coming from the Valley Transit Center, they also have the, the option of traveling on uh, Route 90, which serves Sprague Avenue. Now, the last component I just added in dashed green line represents the connection to Coeur d'Alene and Post Falls from uh, Spokane Valley, again, part of that partnership, pilot, pilot partnership project. So we're gonna be evaluating these over the next few weeks and um, based on the evaluation results and the public input that we receive, uh, we will be refining this to a um, kind of a preferred scenario uh, in more detail with uh, preferred site locations, preferred elements such as transit priority, other facility improvements to existing facilities, and then to develop an initial corridor development plan for outreach in the late spring. Here's our timeline and, uh, for the current activities. And um, I mentioned this is corridor planning uh, is the first phase of this implementation with design engineering following, and then ultimately con construction and implementation. And we have a public open house scheduled for 5.30 on Wednesday evening. It will be on STA's website via Zoom, but the link will be posted at spokanetransit.com slash I-90. And there'll be an online survey there afterwards as well. And uh, just encourage people to, to learn more about it at the website and to provide feedback again, is one of the projects STA committed to as part of STA moving forward. So uh, happy to answer any questions. I know my 10 minutes has expired. Go ahead, Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, thank you. Your, your final comment may have actually answered this. <clears throat> so in terms of the, uh, the, the cost to, to pay for this additional service, that's coming out of the existing uh, sales tax that STA receives? That's correct. I'll just note that the, the three corridors, three routes, uh, that is really the big vision of it. There's at least one and then more express service that's committed to an ST moving forward. And so if we were to add additional, it would be based on available funds and, and, and ridership justification. And just one, one last thing too, uh, uh, and I don't want to take up time on this, but just want to reconnect Carl and talk a little bit about some of the things we had talked about with regard to the El Estero and just providing some of those additional services to some of those that are in between stop. So it'd be great if we could connect on that here in the near term. Yeah, for sure. And uh, we do have some near term investments the board approved uh, in December of last year. And maybe at some point I can circle back and make a presentation on near term investments and perhaps the strategic planning effort in general uh, that's going on at SDA. So I'd be happy to come back and make that presentation. And we'll give you more than 10 minutes. Um, I just want to mention one thing. And I've spoken with Carl and Susan about this. The success of this, in my opinion, really rests on the fact that we would need a dedicated HOV lane to go to Post Falls Coeur d'Alene. You can sit in traffic in your car or you can sit in traffic on a bus. And most people are going to prefer to sit in traffic in their own car. So I think it's vital that as a, as a community, as a region, we have the conversation about HOV lanes on I-90 as we become more and more congested. So um, can you unshare to, so I can see if we're, we need more, we have more questions. 
There we go. There we go. So, uh, Councilmember Bingle, you're not on STA. Do you have any questions? Um, <clears throat> I have a couple, but I know we're short for time, and so I can just reach out to Carl or uh, okay. members of the STA board. Perfect. Thank you. Anybody else? Carla, I really appreciate this. Um, I think it's helpful to keep everybody in the loop. And when you're ready to come back, just let us know, and we'll, we shall give you more time. That's great. Thank you so much for your time today. Have a great okay. day. Thank you. Um, next up, we have a demonstration of the GIS layer for tree planting. I'm going to turn it over to Kara. And Kara, we have Ted you're going to introduce. We have 10 minutes for this. And again, I'd really like to keep some time open for questions from the group. Yes, um, as I am introducing Ted, he can go ahead and share his screen, but I'm really excited to be here today to introduce Ted. Um, Ted Hensold is a forester who's been working with the Spokane Indi or on the Spokane Indian Reservation since 1980. He is also a founding member of the Sustainability Action Subcommittee and joined um, that subcommittee three years ago, participating on the natural resource and the waste and recycling work groups. And one of his particular areas of interest is urban canopy. So with that, I will pass it over to Ted and have him share a little bit about a project he's been working on in partnership um, or along with um, the Spokane Parks and Urban Forestry Department. And Ted, I see your screen is loading. There you are. And we can't hear you if you're talking. Okay, can you hear me now? All right, um, I, I thank you for providing me the time to present uh, this, this information today. I'm hoping, uh, I'm gonna give you a brief demonstration on a GIS application I've been working on to assist the city's parks and recreation department and their partners in meeting goals for increasing the urban canopy. I've created a GIS layer based on GIS data for the streets in the city, and uh, this slide we're looking at the streets clipped to the county county streets clipped to the city. I used other GIS layers, the city tree inventory, a Vista utility lines, and imagery to add information which could help select areas for tree planting. So the additional data fields that I've added to this include the presence or absence of overhead uh, power lines, um, the width of the available planting space, and the number of existing trees that are, are, are currently in place. And I do that for both sides of the street. So there's, that represents six fields of data, and there are a couple other fields of data for each side of the street that I've added based on a calculation of those. I've completed the work so far for 12 neighborhoods around the city. Uh, this next slide is showing highlighted in blue um, the streets that I've completed all the work on, the blocks I've completed all the work on. And that represents about 50% of the street segments in the city. I'm gonna zoom in and look at the first 10 neighborhoods that I had completed at the time that I had put these slides together. Um, this is in the northeast and north central part of the city. And I'm going to show you some different ways we can sort the data to actually use this as a tool to identify where we want to plant trees. So the first data sort is zeroes in on street segments in which there's no planting space on either side, either side of the street. And <clears throat> that is less than five feet. Can't plant a tree in these areas. There's a lot of arterials that are involved, but there's also some pretty significant residential areas where as current infrastructure does not allow space for trees. Let's see, I'm trying to get this to advance. There we go. And now these, this will show you the, the segments that have space for class one trees. Class one trees are the smallest and shortest species of trees and they can be planted under overhead power lines. So this is where we can plant them. Uh, this next slide will show you space for class two trees. These are medium-sized species that can grow within a fairly narrow rooting space. And finally, for these 10 neighborhoods, we're looking at the segments where you can plant uh, 
where you've got space for planting class three trees. And those are the largest trees which require a, a fairly large area for rooting space. And lots of streets will accommodate these. And some blocks, it should be noted that the available space for a class three tree is actually between the sidewalk and the parcel boundary rather than the sidewalk and the curb because there's a significant gap there. So that gives us a lot more space for planting class three trees than I would have expected. Now to get to the real meat of the problem, this next slide, I've added another filter. These are streets or blocks where no trees exist at all, but which will accommodate a class three tree. So we can really zoom in on where we can put a lot of these uh, trees with large canopy potential from this. I'm going to give you one more map. This is a map created by a cohort of mine that was working on this last summer. He, it's called a heat map, which shows the density of existing street and park trees uh, overlaid with the neighborhoods of the city. So you can, the very dark areas, this does not represent where there's actual shade, but it's just sort of an index of where the density is higher or lower, black, blacker areas being higher density of street and park trees. And you can see there's quite a uh, disparity between different neighborhoods. So on the South Hill, for example, in the um, Manitou, Cannon Hill, Rockwood area, you're at about 38%. Now these percentages, by the way, are from the iTree data, so this includes all canopy, not just street and park trees. But they have 30% canopy there. Whereas um, in the, on the northeast, in uh, Shiloh Hills and Hilliard, you've got 11 and 13% respectively. So this, this helps us identify where we really need to uh, add more shade to have a more equal um, canopy distribution around the city. So what, what can we do with this data? Well, we're already, we've already used this in operational planning for the Spokanopy project last fall and again this uh, spring, identifying streets which match the available trees. They're, tr they're looking for space for class two trees. They've got so many, so we, I've given them um, maps showing where those class two trees can be planted and, and there's low density of them. I've given them spreadsheets with block numbers they can uh, check out. And I've also given them a list of, compiled a list of addresses so they can do mailings and just mail directly to residents to see if they want to have a tree. So that's the operational level and that we're already using for some of the target neighborhoods that they're working in so far. As far as the long-term uh, implications, we can use this to develop strategies for a long-term planting plan. And we can also identify engineering obstacles to tree planting and canopy replacement. Uh, so but the tree planting plan is, I think, of a, a really what this started me down on this path. And I, at this point, I'd like to just thank you for providing me the opportunity to present this. I hope this work will be used as a foundation for a data-based citywide planting plan. And creation and implementation of that strategic, strategic plan will require a huge city commitment and investment. And I would really appreciate your feedback on this so I can better understand the level of commitment to the city's urban forestry goals. And I'd be happy to take any questions we have time for now. Sure. Thank you. Council Member Cathcart, why don't you go ahead, start us off. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, really appreciate the presentation. I thought that was some really uh, interesting data that you shared. I'm wondering, have, have have you or or has anybody else maybe taken the next step in analyzing the data to look and see kind of, is there anything, whether it's historical or present day, that's led to these specific disparities in, in you know, the, the percentages of tree density around the city? And, um, and then the, the second question or comment I was going to make was, yeah, and you, you kind of touched on it with mailings and things like that, but it just seems to me like it'd be pretty easy to take, uh, especially your, your third filtered overlay that shows kind of where you can put those larger trees and just do a direct mailing to them. It could even be through our utility bills that, that would offer them the opportunity to, you know, host a tree on their property there or, or in the street and, and be the willing caretaker of that. And uh, it seems like it'd be a fairly quick way to, to start to address this. Right, thank you. Um, as far as the reason, the historic reason for the disparities, it is true that um, nationwide low income neighborhoods tend to have a lesser amount of shade around them. 
And, uh, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of reasons for that, but that's one of the reasons we want to try to address those disparities so that, so that uh, everybody can enjoy the benefits of the shade who's, that are living in the city. Um, in terms of mailings, I think that's a really good idea, and that, that was an idea that uh, the Spokane people came up with to sort of shortcut the shoe leather part of it, which is, can take a lot of time, you get, and especially during COVID, getting you know people not wanting to open their doors when they get a door knock. So uh, I think they'll probably be doing more of that. Well, I, I just I really appreciate this, and uh, you know I, I'm always reminded of a, a comment that I heard Larry Stone make a few years ago when he's working on his Ponderosa project with the Lands Council, and that's that, you know, adding this greenery and the trees, you know, it really just adds a, a vibrancy and a, a feeling of richness. And so you might, you know, struggle economically or live in a, a struggling area, but just improving kind of the aesthetics with the greenery can help just give a different feeling to, to, to where you're living. So I think it's great. So thank you very much. Thank you. Council Member Wilkerson, then Council President. Uh, thank you, Ted. And Others might know, but I did not know we had different classes of trees. So could you just give me a range of what a class one height would be so I can kind of get that in my head? So how tall would a class one go? Oh, well, probably not much taller than 12 to 10 to 15 feet. So think of something like a uh, um, an ornamental hawthorn or an ornamental flowering cherry would be an example of a class one tree. Okay, thank you. Council President? Yeah, oh, Ted, I just wanted to thank you for this. I, it, it's so helpful for us to be able to visualize. I think we sort of anecdotally suspected the same, but to really go down by street by street and, and have it classified of how large a tree, that's also been a problem in Spokane. Uh, too large of a tree and too small of a space uh, tears up sidewalks and all sorts of problems. So I, so I really appreciate it. And I, I think our challenge, you know, we've made a commitment to really increase the uh, tree canopy in Spokane substantially. And I think we've, uh, I don't know if we put it in our resolution, but at least the talk I've heard is that we should start with those areas that have the least canopy uh, to create some equity. Um, but I think our challenge is we've, you know, we've contracted with the Lands Council in the past, really kind of for some pilot projects, but how to scale it up. And so I'm just, putting that out to council and the public is that I think we have to um, make a larger financial commitment and at the same time though, ask for a scale. Um, one of the big expenses on trees is if you is the cost of trees. If you're gonna get a large enough tree that you're planting that really has a good chance of surviving, it costs a lot to you know go to a retail place and get it. it costs less at a wholesale, but if you're really gonna go big on this, you can get in the business of actually growing the, the trees and, and that and having training and jobs and, and that. If you, if, you know, again, if you're going to make a 10-year commitment and millions of dollars worth of trees, you could so magnify the amount of trees if, if you're willing to do that. So I think that's our challenge is to imagine what that scale of project would be. Um, so, and, so we haven't, you know, obviously we did, haven't passed a budget yet, Ted, so we can't give you that commitment, but just in terms of sharing my vision is, is really to meet our 2030 goal. And to do that, we're going to really have to plant a lot of trees every year. Exactly. Yeah. And I'd just like to close by saying if anybody wants to get any more information on this or provide me with any more feedback, please uh, just send your inquiries or questions or whatever through CARA, the SAS coordinator. Thank you. And we have one more question for you. Don't go away. Uh, Councilmember Bigel, go ahead. This actually might be more of a, a comment than, uh, than a question, but um, there's definitely a difference driving on the South Hill versus driving in the Northeast. I mean, driving under the trees is very nice. Um, adding that, that tree cover to the, to the Northeast would be very good. Uh, one of my, I would say, primary concerns would just be um, not just the cost of the city, but you know, in our area, we have a lot of fixed income folks. We have a lot of renters, people who are already watching their rents go up a significant amount. And while this might not seem like a lot, uh, you know, the, the cost of maintaining those trees and whatever damage that it can bring can, can also be, uh, you know, a burden on the Northeast. And so as we're talking about financial investments, that might be something that we would think about to make sure that it doesn't become, 
uh, amid all the other rising costs for, for people, you know, on Social Security or things like that on fixed incomes, um, that it doesn't become a, an, a, a greater burden on the burden that's already been left on them. Yes, I, I would agree. And the first three years of the tree's life are going to be the most critical. So that person who accepts the tree would need to be responsible for making sure it's being watered. There's not a lot of maintenance required those first few years. So by the time that the tree is of any size, um, people may have moved on or we may have in place, I'm hopeful, a maintenance plan for the entire city on street trees so that people aren't picking up uh, the cost of pruning and maintaining to make sure they're safe. And I would also say that Northeast and the part that Ted outlined, it's, it's not just about it looks good, it's about reducing costs for air conditioning, cleaning the air. It's, it is definitely an equity piece for folks who live in treed areas versus non-treed areas. So it's, to me, it's vital that we explore planting in the areas that do not have trees. Now, Council Member Wilkerson, you're going to tag on to me, aren't you? No, I got another comment. Okay. Okay. So go ahead. So especially, I just know when we have developers building new subdivisions, that I would think would be the consideration when trees go in because a lot of subdivisions, trees are not planted at the time those communities are created. So that may be another aspect um, that we need to look at. And that is required now under our urban forestry ordinance. So when you do even some remodeling, if it's an extensive, you're required to plant street trees. So we do have that. And our development services folks are pretty uh, strict about that, make sure that's followed. So, so uh, Council President, you alluded to funding, and that is, I think, the next step is what we want to explore. And I'm hoping that we have a commitment from, if not all of our council members, most of our council members to find funding so we can move forward a little bit quicker and not uh, dally with this project. He's nodding, that's a good sign. All right, anybody else? Thank you so much, Ted. We very much appreciate your hard work. It's, it's been oh. invaluable, so thank you so much. I appreciate your time, thanks. Okay, next up we have Kristen with the 2021 Water Conservation Program Report. We've allocated 20 minutes, Kristen. If you can do it in less, that'd be just super. Go ahead. All right, I'll do what I can. We'll get ready, ready to rock and roll here. Um, thanks for having me today. And I'm Kristen Zimmer. I'm the Water Conservation Program Manager for the City of Spokane Water Department. Um, here we go. All right, so water conservation. We look at that uh, both sides, uh, on our system side and then our customer side, so essentially supply and demand. And on the uh, su supply side, our operations and maintenance. Um, last year, we continued to find, locate leaks, repair mains, normal uh, water department operations. A few years ago, we did revise our hydrant permit program so that any contractor using our hydrants um, need to pick up a backflow device and meter. Um, so that way we're measuring the amount of water that's coming out of hydrants. Um, we will also be adding locks to our hydrants this year as soon as they come in. It's kind of been a supply issue, um, but we'll start slowly locking our entire system. We are adding water filling stations as well. So that way, ideally, no one will need to use our hydrants besides the fire department and the water department. So last year we put a filling station over on the West Plains. It's called Garden Springs Filling Station. And it makes it really easy for contractors to go and uh, just drive up, fill up their tank or their truck. Um, another thing the department as and utilities have been working on is converting our system to a smart metering system. Um, and we are, every meter we replace has the capability of uh, smart metering and we're building the infrastructure so that we can read those meters. We could have that out and deployed within 10 years um, 
with additional funding. Uh, right now, it won't go exactly that fast. Other things will have to be sacrificed. Um, and as far as planning goes, we're looking at a 20-year water system plan with um, ICM, so that provides system modeling, but we're also not only looking at 20 years, we're looking at 50 and 100 and, and beyond. And within that modeling, it includes conservation strategies and how those might affect demand. So it'll be a really interesting um, report that's finalized uh, in the next year or so. Now on the uh, demand side, and that's kind of more of my, my jam here, so, well, not quite yet. But uh, last year, uh, Council ap approved the change of uh, our water consumption rate, so we added a fifth tier. So that was for anything greater than 45 units. Um, we also, Council supported a odd and even watering schedule as well as time of day by resolution, which was really nice. Um, we're working on irrigation and landscaping standards as far as policy changes in the future so that any new development, any new construction that comes in will have uh, efficiency standards to, to meet, and the city will be practicing those um, immediately. Yes? Just, just one quick thing. I, I just, just for anybody watching, just so there's no confusion, I see it says policy changes, and then it includes the odd even. We never actually adopted a code change regarding that. It was more of a, an encouragement. So there really hasn't been a policy change. So I just want to make sure that people watching don't think that we did change, oh, okay. change the code. Thank you. Forgive me for my, my, my uh, language there. But, yeah, it was a voluntary measure, right, and supporting. That was a strategy we had last year as far as education and outreach as well, is to water every other day. Um, thank you. Uh, another another thing we're working on is our utility Utility billing system upgrade, so that will really improve communications with customers. Uh, we'll have more touch points, um, more readability of their utility bill and water consumption. So whenever that's deployed, um, we'll be connecting even better with our customers. And uh, two things I wanted to touch on today is our collaboration with the Parks Department and what we've been doing in the education and technical assistance realm. All right, so for Parks and Rec, um, Council and the Park Board approved an annual investment plan between Public Works and Parks and Rec of $250,000 a year, and that's to be used for future conservation projects and, or efficiency projects. Uh, the Parks Department came or modeled our odd and even watering strategy for the public, and that might have looked like watering half a Manitou one day and the other half, you know, the other, because the parks are can be extremely large, uh, but they were our spokesperson for that um, measure. Last year, we completed a the Manitou Koi Pond uh, project, which if you um, you probably never noticed before, but there the Koi Pond at Manitou Park ran 24/7, 365, with fresh, clean, pumped, chlorinated water, and then would discharge into the sewer system. So since history, that's how it ran. And last year, we put in a recirculating system, so not only saving water and pumping costs, but also sewage treatment. And last year, we saved 21 million gallons. Um, you know, that includes some time off of during the construction. But as far as the average goes for three years, it was 14.5 million gallon savings, um, which we'll be seeing every single year going forward. And one thing I wanted to also, I've, I peppered in here as a way we are connecting with public is through some engaging social media content. So we have a consultant, Rogue Heart Media, that produces videos for the department. Um, and it's just a minute long. So give me a thumbs up if you can hear this. Super excited. We're in Manitou Park today. So we're just rounding up to our finish out our renovation project, which has been a great partnership between Spokane and the Water Department, our conservation and water health project. So what we've done here is rather than pumping, you know, 16, 17 million gallons of water into this pond every year, that actually keeps that water much cooler, much cleaner, and it saves a tremendous amount of water for us. 
this will be our water level sensor. So these two probes, when the water hits it, it's closed, so it'll keep the water right at that level we want. And it also takes readings for us for temperature. What's been really special about this garden for me is how calm this space is. I mean, at their core, Japanese gardens are all about energy. And the energy of this place is one, I think, of a calming influence. And it's uniquely Spokane. The future of this garden is bright. I mean, if you were a fan of the Japanese garden before we did this, these fish will be happier and healthier than they ever have been. We're saving water, we're saving power. I think in the world we live in today, that's a, a pretty cool story. Okay. Uh, so sh showcasing what the city is doing to save water, to be eventually, ideally, be role models for the community on how we use our water. Um, just to, well, we have new council members here, but uh, this is not the first water uh, conservation project, project that Parks has done. They've put in new irrigation systems at two of their golf courses. Um, between the two, they save between 16 to 19 million gallons of water a year. Downriver is currently under construction, so uh, and expected to see about the same amount of savings. Um, in 2020, we uh, put in a automatic irrigation system on Grand Boulevard at Manitou Park so that they were no longer watering at midday and watering, you know, halfway across the street as well. And then two acres of the park that weren't really used design standards for city projects. Kristen, can I yeah. interject something? Yes, I please. don't know if that slide because that is the um, community garden that is right across the street from SAC. And that in itself is saving water because we are no longer watering the grass around that water tower. And I'd also want to put in a plug for the Manito or sorry, for the Cannon Hill park pond which also is leaking about 20 million gallons a year same thing that the manito uh, mirror pond or sorry the koi pond so um there are opportunities we have just a few minutes left Do you want to go ahead oh yes please okay so i uh, wanted to talk about our educational and technical assistance programs um so this is kind of where really where i where i'm sitting at um, we added well, listening to the Water Resource Collaboration Group, um, we added a commercial program. So the list of recommendations you gave us included a commercial program. And so we hired a consultant, and they work with our top 100 commercial users to go out and provide free efficiency, um, not audits, con consultations. So they can review those big water users like uh, cooling tower systems and always uh, irrigation systems. Um, and we had a really successful year for a, kind of our pilot. We had over 18 properties enroll, and that's everything from Sacred Heart to Wells Fargo, um, Lewis and Clark High School, and, and then also a lot of city-owned properties as well. Um, just between, you know, in our first uh, year, we saw 1.5 million gallon savings between the fire department and uh, different stations. Let's see here. Sorry, not moving. Okay, um, our city-owned property uh, work we did was really cool. We partnered with uh, the fire department, and um, you know they love their turf. They love to keep it really nice and green. But we uh, audited four properties at the fire department, and if you look at the chart below, um, the green is a kind of the water you actually need to use for your landscape, and then it's blue or red is what you're using. So when we came to Station 16, they were 310% over budget. And that's pretty similar for the other properties we found. Maybe not, not to that extreme, but they're all a bit over budget, right? Because the fire department has kind of bigger priorities. They have to, you know, they're there to protect the public, not to measure their, their consumption so much. So we worked with them. Um, this picture here is with Eric Ross and, and my team. And we redesigned their system for them, uh, essentially just replacing their heads because it was all ready to go. It was real simple. We found over a dozen leaks as well within that. Um, and then you can see 
after our audit and adjustments, we um, they went to about a normal water use. Um, and just at this uh, station, well, between two stations, they saved almost a million gallons together this summer, which is a lot considering this is maybe, it's more of a um, residential size landscape. It's not that big. Um, a couple stations also have uh, design plans for Spokane scapes. So stations two and eight will hopefully get those planted this year. It's okay. not wanting to move for me. And 17, I just wanted to show kind of the same thing, very much over overwatering. But when you have sandy soil, you can't even tell, right? That water's just going down and the grass stays green. Now they cut their water you know, more in half and that picture is, is in August and it shows you it's still perfectly green. You would never know that they cut so much water out of their um, their budget. Okay, for 2022, we've increased the contractual budget for our commercial program. Um, we are also running a, a pilot with some of the commercial customers to sub-meter their cooling systems. And we've added a residential um, indoor and outdoor consultation program. You can see the picture here is a very cute toddler, but um, that's not why he's there. It's because of that large puddle you see at my neighbor's driveway. This is, you know, midday, not an uncommon sight, right? Um, well, my son really enjoyed jumping in that puddle, but it, it definitely uh, hurt my heart a little bit to see that. And so we're going out to residential customers this summer to help them improve their water consumption and, and just water, water wisely. You know, you can keep a green, green grass with a lot less water. Uh, this is our second year running our rebate program. Um, so we gave out, we credited over $80,000 in utility bill rebates. So our biggest items were smart irrigation controllers and then um, high efficiency toilets. And we gave out over 720 rebates and uh, looked to save about 6.4 million gallons between all of those devices. Um, but we won't have the numbers for at least another year to actually confirm that. That is something we continuously evaluate. Um, one obstacle I did want to talk about for our customers is that if you receive a credit for $600 or more, you, they need to fill out a W-9 and then the city needs to issue a 1099, which is definitely an obstacle for folks. Like not only are they trusting us with their social security number, but then they have to add it to their, their taxes. Um, and um, the energy businesses in Washington State are exempt from this rule. So anything Avista rebates, um, you don't need a W-9. They don't issue 1099s. And um, so something, you know, looking forward, we hope to, to partner um, in whatever way possible to kind of get on that same, same board. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, this almost seems like something we should be chatting with our federal delegation to figure out how to get around this. Um, my, my question is, if you can go back to that last slide that showed the, the amount of gallons saved, can you, can you, I don't know if you know this, and I think Marlene's on, um, does that translate into a specific amount of money that we've saved in the system overall? You know, we hear a lot that, you know, every drop of water costs the system money. So what is 6.4 million gallons removed from the system save us uh, yeah, it's, overall? It's pretty, it's pretty small for the, for the most, remember we, we pump about 23 billion gallons a year. So this is, this is pretty small savings yet. We're, we're doing some work so to be able to, quantify these savings in a real way, as opposed to, um, this is an estimate based on uh, models. So um, we're, we're trying to track all of that. And over time, it's, it's really an overtime issue. So um, this six and a half million gallons and the, the 16 million gallons saved at you know one of the golf courses, those kinds of things over time will add up to something that's more significant. In, in the meantime, um, this is just pushing us in the right direction. And really we're talking about culture change that's gonna take take a while, but we want people to keep thinking about it. And every time they put in a smart controller, every time they put in a new toilet, they've thought about how they're using water. So do you, do you have a way to break down kind of what we spend in terms of like these programs to market and to, to just to do everything that we're, we're committed to doing and, and what that, um, what that breaks down to, you know, per, per gallon of water saved or per million, a million gallon saved. I mean, is there a way to calculate 
are we actually really truly saving a lot um, in the program? Yeah, I did just looking at the the rebate par- program and not marketing, um, but for the credited, you know, amount of utility funds, it's for every dollar of investment should save around seventy seven gallons of water. Um, but that builds every then, year, so that six point four this year will happens next year too with uh, zero cost to us in that fiscal right. year. But I guess, and and uh, just to Marlene's point, I mean, I guess to me the next. The, where I'd really like to get to is that next step, which is, okay, so we save, for every dollar spent, we save 77 gallons. What does 77 gallons save us in cost for the overall system? And mm-hmm. then do the math and see what that equals out to. Right, yeah. And I think that's yeah, we'll have to work on that. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Um, but it's, it's a really good question, you know. So, and as we get more of these wins, um, and the wins will get a little harder, right? You know, Cannon Hill Pond is a council member Kinnear's perfect example. But once we get kind of that park taken care of, the, the gains at each park is going to be a little smaller. Those will be the low-hanging fruit, the koi pond, the, the golf courses. The, you know, so we're, gonna, we're, gonna, um, we're just going to have to keep ticking away at it. And that's also where our long-range planning should help us with as well, where we're looking at other information and the smart controllers that Council President Beggs is a fan of. So, so Council we're going to need to, can we move a little bit quicker? Kristen, are you almost finished with this? Yeah. Um, I just have a can I just weigh in? One thing okay. I want to say, it's not just the operational cost of the electricity to pump the water every year, it's the capital cost. So I think we're spending a little over $13 million for a new water tower near the airport. So that's also a big factor. A big Absolutely. cost driver on this is not having to build towers that we otherwise would. Yeah, or those booster stations and stuff. Exactly, right? We build our system for those four months out of the year, and then we don't need to use it the rest of the months. So to avoid more of that system expansion will really is the hugest benefit for the city. Okay, Lori, I'm going to try to, to breeze through this for you. Um, another thing we're adding is a flume leak detection device, and that was mentioned in the, um, the group recommendations as well. So that will be available to customers for a uh, total of $25 cost. It retails for $150. Um, wanted to touch on Spokane Scape. Real quick, we added a few demonstration gardens around the city um, at our, our water department facility on Foothills. Uh, basically, everything around it you'll see is Spokane Scape now. We uh, partnered with Spokane P that just was up um, to add a Spokane Scape add-in option for folks getting the street tree. So with that, we provide you know, three water smart plants, um, remove a little bit more of the turf, and they're eligible for a rebate if things stay alive the next year. So another incentive for them to keep those trees, trees alive uh, and, a, and a way to tackle the complaint of, well, ooh, I have to water it kind of thing. Um, we've, and then we'll have a demonstration garden with the WSU Master Gardeners over by the fairground. So that'll be a, an active teaching garden for the community. Um, Kristen, my request is, as a former landscape designer, not to use rock because it is a heat sink and mulch would be a better uh, choice. I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, I, this was a, we talked to our maintenance folks and we had to, um, they like to just mow and blow, right? They didn't like this idea. And so we came to this consensus that, okay, rock, we'll try rock, but I, I absolutely agree, Lori. I, I would not do this at my own home. <laughs> um, so some new things for the program. We're adding a designer credit for those that work with a landscape designer. They can receive a, a larger rebate. Uh, folks that have already done a smoke landscape or have a efficient, land, you know, water-efficient Zarek-style landscape in their front yard can now do their backyard. Um, you know, we listen to those the those recommendations, and we want to make the program easier for people to use. So we partnered with the Spokanescape Garden Coach, and he put together five designs. We're calling it Spokanescape in a Box. So they're a real easy way for people to just get started. They can get the design. It has a really easy plant list. And then next year we'll part- partner with the nursery to provide those plants as well. So you can really just, just get started, at, you know, couple hundred square feet at a time and then we'll we have a do-it-yourself video series that'll be up on the website as well 
Okay. Um, and the, for as far as education in, in the community, our um, outreach program, our online engagement, has been growing through Facebook and Instagram. We ran our odd even watering campaigns and different contests and other en engaging factors with our community to get them excited about conservation so that it's no longer a bad word, hopefully. And uh, we had a sub campaign, the Go Gold to Save Blue. I don't know if anyone recognized that sign that may be around your community. Um, it was kind of born in an emergency, right, last year. June, record-breaking temperatures that we've never seen in June, uh, rolling blackouts, uh, ecology declared a drought emergency, and, not, and then we had a national chlorine shortage. Uh, so our, the fire department came to our rescue, and they cut back their irrigation to two days a week, and uh, these signs were made so that the public knows this is on purpose. This is not um, out of laziness or, or what have you. So. Um, they really were very popular with folks, so we made them available at City Hall and at the Water Department for anyone to pick up. Um, so that was a really cool one. And I was going to show you this amazing video, but I'll skip it for time's mm. sake. Oh, will it let me is the mm. question. So, okay, any questions for Kristen? Okay, just a okay. few more, Okay, if I may, if I may. Um, we're adding for the um, educational piece, we'll do a weekly water update that uh, include drought monitor status and river flows. Uh, we'll be featuring our efficiency consultations. Um, and I just wanted to go over so something that council asked for um, in the reporting was consumption figures. So um, now given all of our, the, the recap of 2021, all of those uh, terrible, uh, Situ uh, the unfair uh, summer season to us. We started um, irrigating our lawn in June like we normally irrigate it in July or August, right? So June was hotter than we've ever seen it. And we, we pump more water than ever. And the residential consumption, this bar chart on your right, um, went up to 10.3 billion gallons. Um, and that was pretty much across the board for all of our sectors. We saw that increase. Um, but again, we've never seen a June June like that, and I certainly hope we don't. Um, but, but that's to the to Kristen's point. You know, we've, we've, we're getting the information out there. We're being aggressive with that. But, but clearly, um, weather and conditions are still winning the day. Um, we're at 10.3 billion gallons for the residential sector. You can see the other sectors are up in... Um, we're up in 2021 20, uh, as well, but really that residential sector is the most outstanding change. And so we need to keep um, the, the pedal on. Yes, Council Member Cathcart. Go ahead, Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, I, I guess I'm wondering, so you're, you're saying that it's related to the heat and I'm assuming we have data that suggests that. I, my first thought was that, it, that the big spike is due to people just staying home because you see 20 and 21 mm -hmm. both have a substantial increase over 19 and so if there is there data that, that matches with the, the, the rise in temperatures that this is in fact because of that? Yeah, we that's that's definitely definitely been connected through data. Um, and we can show okay. that really like looking okay. at pumping across the board, the um, because with shutdowns at the commercial facilities, right, indoor kind of residential balanced that. So we weren't really pumping any more than normal. It just it just looks different um, during the pandemic, or I guess we're still in it. Yeah. Um, and we, we did see a real big spike, as Kirsten, or Kristen mentioned, in June when we normally have lower volume. So, so the biggest change last year was June to June rather than July or August when we have more we had more typical typical weather. So um, we're, we want to come back to to this group and and re um, recommit to every other day watering and time of day watering by by resolution or as far as council wants to go with that issue. Um, and, and we're looking at other ways to incentivize that. We're obviously, our planning work um, is focused on what other things we can do, and they're looking at other places. Um, and we really do need to continue to focus on this issue um, so that we can start to see um, our good work actually reflected in the amount that we pump on an annual basis. I, I would like to have a study session on this in a, maybe a couple weeks or a month or two, because this is a long topic for a 
committee. So uh, I'm going to stop it here, Kristen. Are there okay. any more comments from or questions from council? Don't see any. And I got your email, council member Bingo. We can explore that as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the time. We're going to move on to Inga with uh, SMC update on trees and the traffic control device conflict. So this is the day for trees. Go ahead, Inga. Okay. Yes, we are going to talk about trees some more, and I'll try to make this quick. So um, this is a staff-initiated request. We've been having some issues internally trying to decide what standard to apply to visibility of signs from the roadway. And so what we want to do is provide just some clarification in the city code so that everybody is using the same distances from development services to streets to um, plans that are brought in by, um, by developers and urban forestry, we're all on the same page. So what we're trying to avoid is something like this where you can't see a stop sign. Um, we've had issues like this where we have a tree that is not blocking anything when it's newly installed, but then eight years later, it's grown and um, the branches are starting to encroach and blocking a stop sign. Another example, this is one that was downtown where our lane use sign was completely hidden by the tree. In this case, we were able to just move the sign, which works sometimes. And this is another one where we had the roundabout was planned. And I want to say it had double the number of trees on the initial landscape plan. But when it got to construction, they found that some of the trees that were supposed to be installed would block the view of the crosswalk signs or the yield signs. And so they were not put in. So what we're ultimately trying to do with this ordinance is just to establish what this minimum visible distance to different kinds of street signs needs to be. And we're hoping that this will cut down a little bit on the amount of pruning or tree removal that has to be done throughout the city. So this is the table that we put together and everybody was in agreement on amongst the city staff. Um, this would be a brand new table in our municipal code. The idea is just to set it up with different speed limits. And you can see we have three different categories. On the left, we have the minimum visible distance for traffic signals and pedestrian hybrid beacons, which has to be a certain distance per the manual and uniform traffic control devices. The middle category is what we're calling priority signs and rapid flash beacons. And so that's for signs where um, there basically could be a right of way conflict if somebody doesn't see the sign. So this would be like a stop sign, a yield sign, a crosswalk sign, um, specifically signs where the vehicle has to stop or yield to another road user. And then all the other signs on the road, this would be like merge signs, speed limit signs, basically anything that doesn't fall in those other two categories is in the column on the right hand side. And then you can see those are a shorter distance. We don't think you need to see those for a full, um, you know, more than a couple hundred feet. You should get enough time to process the sign as a driver if you can just see them for that distance. And then we do have um, in the footnotes at the bottom, a small exemption for things like parking signs, no parking bike lane signs and transit signs, where we're just saying you need to see those for 30 feet and that's enough because you're usually gonna be slowing down when you um, approach those or it's not something that is really gonna impact how you drive the road. This is the code that goes along with it. Um, basically just establishing that we will try to prune or relocate the traffic control device um, before we look at re removing a tree entirely. Um, there is some language in here that says the trunk of the tree is exempt from this requirement. Um, generally, the tree trunks are small enough that they're not an issue. It's similar to having a utility pole next to the roadway. Um, I am going to double check this one more time with our staff committee though, before I bring this back um, to council for the study session. 
I just think to make sure that that's not going to be an issue when we have really large trees. Inga, this is an issue because owners of property, so owners aren't allowed to prune trees within the city right away. In other words, if you have a street tree, you don't get to prune it. So this, mm -hmm. this it needs to be clarified that you can't prune a tree if it's in the city right away. Okay, I will discuss that with urban forestry. Okay, I'll, I'll make a note of that and figure that out before I bring it back to you. Um, so the other things we're gonna try to do on the staff level is try to get traffic signs and tree landscape plans on the same sheet of paper when they come in for review because usually they're done by two different groups and it's hard to review them if we don't see them on the same sheet of paper. And um, urban forestry is also going to look at specifying high headed trees, which basically means trees that will have their branches higher up. Um, we're gonna look at specifying those along streets because that makes it easier to maintain the visibility to signs. And this is our schedule. Just we've been working on it since November and hopefully would like to get it cleaned up and adopted in March. Questions for Inga? I can't see everybody, so. I'm gonna need two sponsors on this to bring it out of committee. Does anyone want to be those sponsors? Uh, Brian said yes. Brian said yes. And Councilmember Wilkerson? Yes. Two. Okay, we've got two. That's really exciting. Thank you. Inga, I ask Inga a question though, or my Go concern. Uh, this pruning uh, by owners, we know we have a high rental occupancy in the city. So who's, who monitors this? Or do we report it? Or is the citizen to report it somewhere? If, if there is an issue, like I have a corner in my neighborhood that the yield sign is completely blocked, accident several times a year. Who would I contact to do that we're, work? We're not allowed to. If you read our urban forestry ordinance, citizens aren't allowed to prune street trees. And Inga's going to check on that. But I mean, I we were that. really specific about that when we crafted that ordinance. You can get yourself in a lot of danger, especially if there are wires overhead. Um, mm. You're working in the street right away. You don't want, you know, Fred with his chainsaw out there working on a street tree. That's a really dangerous thing to do. Yeah, I think it has to be a licensed arborist. Is yeah, what I exactly. Okay. I'll get answers to this before I come back. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we're going to move on to the um, SRTC call for projects, and this is Kevin. Kevin, we've got 15 minutes for you. You want to go ahead? Well, Kevin's bringing that up. Uh, I just wanted to make the connection between all of the great study sessions we've had with council talking about Kevin's program and how projects get into the program. And if you recall, some projects come in through um, data developed, i.e. we have data driven projects that come in through grant writing. We come through council, come through grant writing if we're successful in getting the program. Other ones we choose through what we call the selection matrix. Those are those rebuilds, those significant cost projects that we prioritize with the community. And as we go through, uh, we have them in the program and we look for those grant opportunities. And obviously what we've talked about before, those grant opportunities have certain rules that we have to follow. And so Kevin's gonna talk about both types of projects and talk about some of the rules that we had to follow for this current call. Sure, thank you, Catherine. Um, again, this is touching on a couple different grant programs. This is the second touch on the SRTC call uh, for projects. Uh, we did brief this at the uh, January meeting as well, so it's a second touch on the SRTC call. Um, I do have some of the slides I presented last time in terms of the um, overall grant details and, and some specifics on that, but in the interest of time, Um, in the briefing paper, um, what this is, is the list of projects that, you know, that we've been considering for uh, submission for the SRTC call for projects. This list hasn't changed, same. 
uh, I prepared this table for this uh, briefing paper and presentation, just adding a little bit of additional information. So along with the project list, listed along the left side there, we've noted whether the projects are, are included in our six-year program, six-year street program already. Um, I've noted projects that already have uh, either current or prior funding that's been dedicated or spent on them, either for um, planning studies or for the kind of early preliminary engineering work. And those were all noted here as well as in the comments. And then just to give you a kind of context, the size of projects so it's included kind of our earlier draft estimates uh, of cost, total cost for those projects. Um, again, 18 and 19 projects here on this list. Um, we are intending to submit um, all or most of the projects. So, you know, it's possible one or two projects um, may fall out uh, in the end, but this is the list that we're going off of. Um, one project, you know, we can either do it right now or, or towards the end, but one project we do need to focus on and kind of get some concurrence or okay from council on is this US-95 uh, Meadow Lane project that I have highlighted. Um, but before I kind of kind of get to that, I do have a specific slide on that if the discussion goes that direction. But before uh, I do that, I just kind of wanted to open up to council and, and see if there's any specific questions or dialogue they'd like to have on the list of projects. I can't see everyone, so do you want to chime in, please? Kevin, you've managed to just mute every single council member. That's never happened before. Wow. Yeah. This is Karen. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, so, Kevin, I'm following up on some notes that council member Mum left me before um, she was done with her um, commitment to the city. And one, one of the, the questions, questions is that um, there was a note that basically was talking about somebody was pursuing um, SRTC funding for Strong Road. Do we know anything about that at all? No, I mean, we've, we, we have not pursued Strong Road as an application uh, through the SRTC call or any other grant programs. You know, that went into the, that project went into the program a little less than two years ago. Um, so yeah, it's not currently um, on a list of, of projects that we're applying for. Um, you know, from this list, you know, it's important to point out there's a lot of projects in our six-year program that aren't on this list or that we're not applying right. for. Uh, right. Just being, you know, we gotta be practical and realistic. All of these are not gonna get funded, you mm -hmm. know. So we try to put our best foot forward in terms of looking for the projects that are going to score the best. It's a competitive program, uh, it's mostly data-driven. Uh, so you know, Strong Road is is not on the list as of now. A lot of these projects that are on the list have been in our program for years. Uh, some of them we've applied for various grants for, including through SRTC in the past, uh, you know, several times. And, you know, so we're continuing to prioritize those. And if constituent mom calls or members of the community, my constituents up in that area, um, and request it, what is that process? Do I forward um, those questions or um, request for information to you and Catherine, or do I just take note of it and, and make sure that we know that people are calling about it? I just want to know the process in case I get calls. Sure. I think you know the the uh, uh, the fact that it's in the program. Uh, that's that's what we look to for opportunities, and uh, we certainly will when the opportunities uh, arrive. We'll be we'll be pursuing that project. But um, in terms of the com conversation, I think we're you know we're out there every year talking about the program itself, and happy to answer questions along the way. So if not this S SRTC program, there might be something else out there, um, and in the form of grants that might be more appropriate? Definitely more appropriate is the, what we're looking for. Um, every project call that we get or again, from, from either a state or a federal opportunity, they come with their own rules, and we try to match up, as Kevin said, the best opportunities, what we have in our program with those rules in front of us at the time. That's what I need. Thanks. You bet. Any other questions? Karen, that was good. Thank you. Kevin? Um, looking at the reconstructions, the Mallon Avenue uh, to Monroe, Monroe to Howard, I'm going off of memory, but I'm, re I'm 
I'm remembering the matrix that did that was not the fourth highest scoring project. Is that true? Is it lower than that? Correct. And, yeah, cor correct. I mean, you know, ult ultimately there were a variety of reasons for the reconstruction projects why they got chosen. They were generally from those sort of upper quartile, if you will, of projects. And some other um, considerations, is my understanding, and entered into the equation there in terms of having regional facilities like the like the arena and like the public facility, um, public safety complex and county core complex, or being on a Bloomsday route, for instance, some of those other things. Uh, Kind of rose up and it may pushed Broadway and Mallon um, a little yeah. bit further up the list. And I totally get Broadway, uh, but Mallon, it's, I guess the thing is, especially if we diverge from the matrix, it, I guess it would be helpful to come to council and say, all right, this is eight down, and these are the ones we're saying no to that are above it. Do you agree? So that's, that's my only comment on on that is that if we're going to use the matrix, great, but if we're going to diverge from the matrix, then it seems like we should have a little bit of a discussion with council members of, hey, here's the other options that are higher, but we these are the reasons why we think Mallon, as opposed to it just showing up on the list. So I'm not sure the best way to get you that feedback or what's going to work, but that's, again, if we're especially if we're diverging from the matrix. So the uh, projects you see on the on the list right now have been in the six-year improvement program for several years now. So that process of going through the subcommittee, the transportation subcommittee, and talking through it, their 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 recommendation is what we brought forward to council several years ago in terms of process. So to make you feel better, council president, uh, we certainly can just keep Mellon. Uh, in the six-year program and not, and not apply for it this time around to have that bigger conversation that you'd like to have. But everything that is on the list that says yes in the six-year program has gone through that public and, and process in general. Yeah, and I'm, yeah, no, I get that. I'm just, in terms of picking winners and losers that are on the in the six-year program to ask for, I'm not saying that this is the wrong one. It's just that I'm feeling like we're flying a little bit blind in terms of what our constituents, when they come to us and say, hey, wait a second, that was number eight, uh, it would be good for us to say, yeah, we said yes to that because of A, B, and C. That's the piece that I'm looking. So maybe if it, we had just a short, I mean, literally just a two paragraphs that says, hey, these other projects were above, but this is why we chose Mallon instead of these other ones, even though they ranked higher. For this funding, so, and it might be the the grant funding that's at issue. That's like, oh yeah, well, Malin meets this, and these other ones don't. But I just don't know enough to defend it. We certainly can um, um, go back and, and talk about some of those decisions that were made in the past, and, and um, some of the dialogue that came out of the subcommittee was not wanting to select all of the top ranking ones because they all fall in the downtown core. The subcommittee felt that that wasn't fair to put all of the money in one place. And so they were really trying to move out a little bit in terms of, you know, several were already in the program like Riverside, like Spokane Falls Boulevard, and, and quite frankly, the Mellon, you know, you could consider that downtown too. But we also had the Broadway, which was selected in that very dialogue about there's, there's a lot already focused uh, in, in that area. So that, some of that feedback, would that help? Yeah, it, it helps, um, but it's like there's two pieces. There's the, all right, we're not going to do the ones above because they're in the downtown core, which is fine. But there might be some other Mallons and Broadways out there that we might say we like those better than the Mallons. It, it, so it's sort of the last four in, the last four out, just kind of having a little bit of context around it so that when people ask us, we're like, no, there's very good reason for this. Here's why. So. Okay. It'd be helpful to. Any other questions? So, Councilman Kinnear? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I guess the only thing I would add is I just, I have a little bit of consternation over Havana and um, in part just, I, I really feel like that's more of a regional project or it needs some regional buy-in and not just us because there's a benefit to a lot of folks, not just the city. Um, and I also wonder too, you know, there's the, the rail crossing there 
And I wonder if that's not something that we should be thinking about long term for how we could get around that rail crossing or do something differently. And that would obviously be a substantial investment. And um, and so I just think that's something that we should be talking regionally uh, in terms of addressing. In, in terms of a regional project, we certainly will be talking about that in the application. We are, you know, going to SRTC being our regional funding agency. Uh, that is certainly a point that we're making in our application itself. But the roadway is in the city of Spokane uh, boundaries, and um, you know, we wouldn't expect another agency to put money in, but we would expect, again, at the regional table that our council members sit at, that we have that dialogue about that regional uh, com component to that project specifically. Well, and I and I get that, and I don't I don't disagree that it's it's ours. I mean, it's kind of ended up in our our lap, but but I think um, there are other projects that are certainly a higher priority to me that I would that I would definitely like to see us try to tackle before we get get here. And I think if there's other uh, either municipalities or the county or others that really want this done soon, then then we should work together with them and figure out a way that we can all make that happen. I'm going to agree with you um, simply because there is a fairgrounds right there and it's to the county's benefit to have that road as pristine as possible and as usable, especially that railroad crossing piece, which is a nightmare. So I would encourage us to do some sort of collaboration on that road rather than go it ourselves. I know it's ours, but it's going to benefit the county much more than it will us. And this is Brian. I agree, especially since they forcibly gave it the road to us right before it needed to be fixed. So in this context, uh, we are looking to the existing six-year you know, uh, CIP for project uh, uh, types. And again, the, the list that Kevin brought forward are ranking the highest. So in this particular case, I would suggest we just not apply for it at this time. Uh, in, in the sense of these were you know, the groupings that uh, we felt fit the best with this application process. Great. Any other questions? I can't see you also. Please sure. One, one more piece on Havana. Um, it's not just about the road. We have very significant water pipelines going through that road that are aged. So it, it, it's a matter of we certainly can take it out of the uh, running this round. But um, at some point, we will have to be getting in there to, to rebuild those pipes, and that will cause a significant uh, disruption to the road itself. And again, that would be something that the county would be interested in, because I imagine those pipes supply them with water as well for the fairgrounds. Uh, there, there are major transport or transmission mains uh, versus mm -hmm. distribution, so okay. I suspect they're actually going to our system. Okay, yep. good to know. Anybody else? Kevin, do you have more? Otherwise, we're going to... Yeah, just on. yeah, as quick as I can here. I just do want to call attention again to U.S. Uh, 195 Meadow Lane. Um, make sure that council is comfortable with us applying for that project or, or get any, uh, you know, have any dialogue we need to have on that. Can you remind us what that project is? Sure. One second. So this was the J turns, a meadow lane. Um, it's really a safety driven project. Um, Inga's here as well. She can jump in if we have kind of more details to share, but that's construction of uh, you know, the J turns, uh, you know, for both directions to travel at meadow lane. If you recall, council took action a few cycles ago to remove city funds from this project. It's still sitting in our six year program, but uh, council had uh, requested that city funds be removed from it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, yeah, I know there's some other work being done in the area that's uh, potentially alleviating some of the, the traffic issues, but is this project specifically still necessary for some of those residential developments to be able to move forward? Yes. I, I can okay. if it, stand on that. If so, like. then, yeah, I mean, if it is needed for, for that to happen, then I think we, we've got to figure out how to execute because you know, we just, we need more residential, obviously. So we just got to figure out how to, how to make this work. Council member Wilkerson, go ahead. Uh, thank you. And uh, council member Cat Carter, I hear you, but there have been discussions going on with that neighborhood and that J turn and our partnership with WashDOT. So there are a lot of moving parts on that strip. 
and Inga might want to weigh in on that a little bit. But that's one of those questions, which comes first, the chicken or the egg, uh, on that 195 strip. If Council would like a little background, Inga is here, obviously. She can give you a, a little snapshot if you'd like it. We're and really short for time, so let's make it uh, a minute or less if we could. And could you, while you're doing it, explain whether this project is the one where the developers agreed to do it in exchange for credit against their impact fees? That might not be this project. But I just okay. So this project is in our impact fee program. It has been since 2019 since we did the update. Um, but it was canceled the last time we discussed it was reluctant to pursue it. And that, that was like two years ago. Um, so it's been sitting out there. It has to be done before most of the development projects out there can move forward. There are many hundreds of houses that can't be completed until this is done. They have a couple other conditions too. This isn't the only one. So we do have a consortium of developers that is on the hook to do this. Um, it is very complicated, though, to get that many developers together and to fund a project like this on a state highway. And it would make things a lot smoother if it became a city-run project, basically partnered with Washington. And we would still use impact fee money as match which comes from, obviously, when developers uh, pay that money. Questions, anyone? Um, we're, there's some talk about focusing the impact fees in this area, so we're not sharing them with the uh, other side of the South Hill and maybe increasing the impact fees that would help fund these kinds of projects. Where, where are we at timing-wise with that? Uh, we were scheduled to come to a study session on March 24th for that specific topic, but the preceding um, study session on the 17th, we're going to be beginning the dialogue. Uh, it, it stems back to the study that uh, was recently completed through SRTC. So we're going to do a next steps on what happens after that study and then followed by an impact fee conversation. And it, it, that's, it will be covering the topics that you're referring to, Council President. Anyone else? Thank you. Okay, so I, so I guess just to make sure we're clear, if I'm not hearing any objections, I think we'll proceed with um, preparing and submitting an application for this project, um, unless we hear otherwise. I, I'm, I'm a yes on that. Is anybody a no? That'd be easier. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So we will pull out the Havana Street bridge, or excuse me, Havana Street project, Havana Street. if I heard that correctly. Yes. Yep. All right, the rest of the list we will pursue. Okay. Thank and then you. finally, I just wanted to pivot to the second grant. Um, so this is the National Highway Freight Program. This program has been discussed in a couple other venues uh, with council. This is a, kind of a unique program, a little bit newer one. It's federal funding administered through WashDOT. WashDOT's taking a little different approach, a unique approach, and asking that the MPOs get involved and screen projects on a regional basis and determine a much shorter list of projects that get submitted from local agencies to WashDOT. SRTC has kind of gone through that exercise already. It's been discussed at the SRTC board uh, a couple times now, I believe. Um, applications are due March 11th. SRTC then turns around and forwards the applications to WashDOT on March 16th, and this will be discussed at the March 10th um, SRTC board meeting as well. Um, this is the preliminary screening list that SRTC has developed in terms of looking at the projects and looking at the, uh, the scoring criteria that WashDOT has, has put forward or the considerations for scoring. They've come up with this initial uh, kind of five project list that's been discussed at the SRTC board level. Our project that's uh, within that top five as well as the Avenue for Edge of Havana. So we have a draft application prepared and um, we're you know, working on finalizing that and, and intending to submit that to SRTC, um, you know, by the deadline next week. Um, any any questions? Anything else? Anybody else? Okay, Kevin, uh, um, Catherine, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And Marlene, you're up next for the Falls Tower Development Agreement discussion. And for this one, we will need to council sponsors as well. So go ahead, Marlene. Thank you, Councilmember Kinnear. Um, so. This is a, uh, an update to the developer agreement for the Falls Tower project at um, Broadway and Lincoln. Just actually, I'm looking at the site right outside my window now. So 
Um, and this would provide $200,000 to the developer to route the sewer to provide public benefit. So it would move it from um, the river's edge and out from underneath that pro private property and put it through the intersection of Lincoln, Brenton, Broadway, and then down Lincoln to Summit Boulevard. Um, that does a couple things. It gets rid of the sewer underneath a private property, which is very helpful to us going forward. But it also provides sewer access to some underutilized properties that are really close to, of course, Riverfront Park, Kendall Yards, um, and the downtown. Those parking lots, primarily dirt parking lots located to the west of Lincoln that don't have access to sewer right now. So that actually helps to increase development opportunities for that and probably an area that we would like to see um, develop into other uses that are more, that are higher and better than dirt parking lots. So, and the new location also, of course, provides for better protection for the Spokane River. Moving the sewer away from the river's edge is always a good thing. So we are going to bring that forward to you um, and we'll need, as the council member mentioned, a sponsor for that. To, oh, good book. There they are. Council Member Bingo and Cathcart will be your sponsors. Thank you both. Our next, um, and thank you, Marlene. We Sorry. have a third sponsor. We have a third sponsor, but a question. And that okay, is go ahead. So we're going to substantially increase the value of those properties. Is there a latecomer hookup fee that we can recoup some of that $200,000 from? Those we have not set up a latecomer um, fee. I can have legal take a look and see how that might operate if you would yeah. like. Yeah. Great. This is just the developer agreement, but we could certainly um, look at the other end as well. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Marlene. Um, so we have our last thing that was not on this agenda, but you all received the Ukrainian-Russian uh, resolution that Council Member or Council President and I crafted, and I w we'd like to have it read tonight. And Council Member Bingo, I wonder if you'd be so kind as to read it for us. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, is it a resolution, Council President? So he doesn't need to read it, or how does it work? Well, it's it is a resolution, but he we have to read it because it's laid on the thing. So he could read it instead of Terry Fister. But let's do that. I'd like that. Is is that okay with you, Council Member? Okay, perfect. Um, are there any questions about it? Seems obvious to me, but some of you might go, "What's this about?" If you don't know, we have issues in Ukraine right now. I if Understand. I could comment on it. Uh, real quick, I appreciate when you guys were drafting it up that it doesn't uh, just mention the Ukrainian population, but also, uh, you know, support for our Russian population here as well that was not yeah. involved in making the decision. So I appreciate the way you guys drafted that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Any other comments or go to the order stuff? And our next meeting is going to be March 28th. So we will see you all at 3.30 for our briefing. And in the meantime, um, you know, get dinner or whatever else, and we'll see you then. Thank you.